So Nehemiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Jessam, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to the time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying out a great project and can't go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sam Ballot sent his aide to me with the same message. In his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written... It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to this report, you are about to become their king and have been appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, and I'll strengthen my hands. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Jelai, son of Methabel, who was shut in at his house. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors. Because men are coming to kill you by night. They are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiath and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember, Tobiath and Sanballat, my God, Because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet, prophet, Odiah, and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elu in in 52 days. When all of our enemies had heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence. Because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was son-in-law to Shechani, son of Arhar, and son of Jehon, and married the daughters of Meshulam, son of Barachai. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds, and then telling me what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. So this story here in Nehemiah chapter 6, imagine, if you will... You are a captive in a land that you did not grow up in. Your parents and grandparents told you about a city that was great. A city where God's presence lived in. They would tell you that year after year growing up as a child. But being that you're not in your homeland, you were sent away uh, by force. You were taken by another army. And you now are a cupbearer of a royal position in the king's house of a foreign king. And you look forward to the day when one day God will bring his people back into the land that they were taken from. The day comes around. You get to go back. You lead a group of people into the land. And when you get there, at night you go and you survey the data, survey the city. The walls are totally burned. They're broken down. Your heart inside of you says, what can I do and be a part of this rebuilding of this city? And you start the work. You gather the people together, you start to rebuild. As you're there in the rebuilding process, you're excited, you know God's there, you've prayed about it, you know he's with you, and then what happens, everything you don't expect. The people that are supposed to be caring for the people of Israel, the nobles and the leaders, not only are they charging them interest, they're mistreating the people. Not only that, you have to have a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other to protect yourself because people keep coming in to discourage you, to stop the work. And the question is, why should you keep on going? Everybody's telling you not to do it. The people are tired. 
what do you do? Do you continue on in the work? Do you give up? And this idea of perseverance, I think, kind of marks Nehemiah's work. Perseverance through discouraging people, perseverance through difficult work, and perseverance with people in the work, the burden of leading others. Perseverance in discouraging people, perseverance through difficult work, and perseverance with people in the work and leading them. When I think of perseverance through this discouraging, destructive people around him, you see in verse 1, it says, When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, and the rest of our enemies that had rebuilt the wall, and not one gap was left in it, they sent me a message. This group of people right here, they had, throughout this process, had been discouraging Nehemiah to rebuild the wall. In chapter 2, in verse 10, the question is, it starts to tell us why they want to discourage him. When Sambalat, the Hornite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, officially heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. The enemies of Nehemiah have a reason for not wanting to continue the work. They didn't like the people. Hey, I don't want you helping those group of people over there. I don't want those people to be taken care of. I don't like them. So anybody that helps them, I'm going to come and oppose them. Not only that, they were opposed to the wall. They were opposed to building this, this wall that was going around all of this because that would mean that the people, the temple, the work that they're doing, to be a people back in this land, See, they were in charge of the whole area, and they didn't want that. So they ridiculed the work. Tobiah the Ammonite, who, uh, Nehemiah 4, 3 said this, who was at his side, this, um, was saying, what are they building? Even a fox climbing upon it would break down their wall of stones. So not only did they ridicule the work, they want, did not want them to participate in the work, but they did not want the people to thrive. The enemies that are against Nehemiah have no goodwill. It's, it's not that, hey, I just don't like what you're doing. I don't like you. <laughs> That's the problem. I don't like you, and I don't like the work that you're doing. So when they hear about the work almost coming to completion, it's their last-ditch effort to stop it. So what do they do? When they hear about it, it provokes them to do something. It provokes them to personally harm Nehemiah. When it says here in verse 2, Sambalat and Geshem sent me this message, come let us meet together one of the villages in the plain of um, this oh no place, which no one really knows where it's at. Nehemiah said, hmm, you want me to go to the secluded village by myself to meet you. That doesn't sound like a great idea. And he says, but they were scheming to harm me. You see, working with people that are not only discouraging, but don't believe in anything that you're doing, they're going to do anything it takes to win. And winning means, if it comes to harming you personally, I will do whatever it takes. That was their message. They were so persistent in their message to lure Nehemiah away, away from the work, they sent him here, a message four times. They kept persisting and persisting and persisting. Nehemiah, come out to this village. We got something to tell you. <laughs> I bet you do. Well, since that didn't work, how do people discourage? Where do they do to discourage him? The next thing that they did was seeking public embarrassment. They were going to drag his name through the mud with everybody. Verse 5, what they then do... Then the fifth time, Sam Ballant sent his aide to me with the same message, and his hand was an unsealed letter. Now, that's kind of an important fact. This unsealed letter means that anybody could have read it. As the aide would travel back to Sam Ballot and tell him, hey, uh, Nehemiah said uh, no. And uh, Sam Ballot got really angry, said, go tell him again. 
Well, he, I, this is the third time, man. I mean, he's going to tell you no again. I, I, you want me to go back? And so Sam, when he comes back and tells him no, on the fourth time, Sam Bellet says, okay, go take this letter. Oh, I'm not going to seal it. So what does that mean? People are going to find out what I wrote. And what was his message? It is reported among the nations in Geshem, says it's true. That you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to this report, you are about to become their king. And have been appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. This is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let's meet together. Who looks like the hero in the story? Sam Ballot. Hey, Nehemiah, I'm just trying to help you out, man. And th the word on the street is that you're doing all of this so that you could become king. Oh, I didn't encrypt the email. So I put it and said, I sent you this message, but I did it on my Facebook timeline so you could see it. Whoops. That's what he's essentially doing. He's looking for ways to publicly not only... <laughs> Not only say untrue things about Nehemiah, but to make it a public spectacle. How can we take our personal issue, my disdain for you privately, how can I make it a public thing? And I'm going to find ways to drag your name into the dirt. The next thing that he does here... He tells them... As he drags his name through the dirt. That what you're doing here. As he, and I think this is great. Has argument. Sam Ballot's argument to Nehemiah. The first thing I think that he says here. That's, that's fascinating. He goes that you've appointed verse 7. Prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. He goes. Nehemiah as he publicly disgraces him on Facebook. You said that you are setting it up so that God puts you in this position. So you've hired messengers of God to make this true. So, and so it's, it's fascinating. He's, he's, he's trying to say this is your strategy to make yourself king. You are trying to get other people to say that God has told them that this is what is true. Not only that, that you refuse to meet with people to work it out. So you're, you're claiming God's authority, and this is his accusation, but you don't want to do anything about it. Now, how would you respond to a claim like that? A public disgrace in front of everybody to see. So Nehemiah says in verse 8, nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up in your head. Nehemiah doesn't get baited into the argument. Hey, I know you're publicly disgracing me. But, I'm not, but you're just making this up. I didn't do it. Not only is he using seeking public embarrassment. He's also looking for prophetic discouragement. So what they do is they find people, prophets, who you can buy to speak on their behalf. So it's like putting in um, a spy or a mole. It, it's actually not only even that, it's, it's actually paying someone to go out and post things and talk about things that aren't true. The story continues on, and we find Nehemiah going to this prophet's place, this prophet's house. Verse 10, one day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Delai, son of Methabel, who was shut in at his home. Why was he at his home? Was he sick? Was Nehemiah doing a house visit? We're really not sure. But he went to this prophet's home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. What was happening with this prophet that they had hired is if they couldn't get him to be baited out publicly for a debate... If they personally tried to attack him with personal threats, then what they did is, we're going to get somebody to say, God told me this is what you should do with your life. 
So, so really, they're, they're really creative in discouraging him. Personal attacks, public embarrassment, and now it's having people speak on God's behalf. Now, the thing about a prophet is, they were one commissioned by God to tell people what God has said. So when the prophet comes to Nehemiah and he's talking, or they're, they're in, Nehemiah comes to his house and they're talking, the prophet wants to tell them, listen, God told me somebody's going to kill you, so the only way to protect yourself is lock yourself in the temple. Now, why, why is that a big deal? Because it's a trap. The only people that are supposed to be in this part of the temple are the priests. What they're doing is trying to discredit him by self-protecting himself, the prophet recommends, by going in the temple, which would show that he doesn't respect God. I mean, they're, they're really kind of clever when they're trying to discredit Nehemiah from the work. Second Chronicles chapter 26, Uzziah became powerful. His pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. And at that mo moment when Uzziah did that, that was the priest's job. God punished him for that. So they're going to the prophet. Hey, God told me, man, you need to go protect yourself. Come in the temple. What does Nehemiah say? Verse 11 should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? So, so you're telling me the only way that I can save my life is going to a place I'm not supposed to go. I will not go. I will not go. The last thing that I think happens here to discredit Nehemiah through a discouraging people is one of the leaders. So he personally sends him this. He looks for public embarrassment. He looks to discredit him through a prophet. And the last thing is, he uses people of influence. Look at what it says here in verse 17. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. So remember, they, they didn't have text messages where they could gossip about peace, people, so they did it through letters. So the nobles, people of influence and power in the land, kept sending letters to this guy in Judea who had some notoriety. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Ara, and son of Jehonan, had married the daughter of Meshuzam, son of Berkai. However, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling me, what, telling him what I said, and Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. So, so they can't get to Nehemiah directly. They can't get to him through uh, causing an uproar through public embarrassment. They can't get to him by using a prophet to speak on God's behalf. So then they go to people of influence. And these people of influence say, man, Nehemiah, you got to give these guys a shot. They're really good guys. You should trust them. And Nehemiah is like, well, didn't you swear an oath to these people? Aren't you loyal to them? And so, so imagine, you are doing a work because you believe God has called you to that work. And discouraging people are using every means possible that not can have you to continue. And at any point of this, you can just throw in the towel. I'm done. I'm tired of people telling me this. I'm tired of people saying in God's name. I'm tired of people that have influence coming and harassing me about this. Nehemiah was getting hit from every angle constantly. You can only imagine Nehemiah goes to this prophet's house. He goes in. He's like, oh, this again. Oh, of course. Not only that, the work that Nehemiah was doing not only was he incredibly discouraged, he was persevering through a difficult work. Now, what is said here in the very last verse here, chapter 6, he sent letters to intimidate him, but verse 15, so the wall was completed on the 25th of Elu in 52 days. 
Now, what some people would say is, that's hustling pretty fast. You're moving pretty quick to get that wall up. Josephus would, would disagree with this date and say it took a lot longer. And, it, and uh, the question, though, is, why does it say 52 and Josephus gives a much longer time period? What I think is happening here, though, is when, it's, when Nehemiah is writing this, I think Josephus probably said, there's no way they figured it, they did it that quickly. So I think he just kind of, he maybe adjusted the number. Because I think what they were doing, and he says up to this point, we got everything but the gates figured out. But not all the wall is totally broken down. There were sections of it that, that they didn't have to go to the footer and redo the whole thing over again. But at some parts of it that they had to. And there wasn't a shortage of labor. And I think when Nehemiah tells them, hey, I'm not going to go talk to you. Uh, one, because I know you're going to try to kill me and harass me. But two, there's a lot of work to do. Nehemiah not only was a leader that understood the scope of the project, he was very much involved in the project. The work not only was grueling, rebuilding a wall, trying to get these massive cornerstones, all these things back into place. The complexity of that, the complexity of work alone, can want to make us give up. Man, my job is so hard. I had so much work to do. Just the pressure of the work alone could be discouraging. Not only that, the pressure from all these outside people are discouraging. But Nehemiah continues to persevere. The last point I want to talk about, perseverance with people in work. The thing about what Nehemiah does and continues to do amongst all the pressure that he's receiving from these people and from the actual physical labor of it. Nehemiah has a resolve of why he's there. He knows why he is here. He says in verse 8, I sent them this reply, nothing like what you're saying is happening, you are just making it up in your head. Even when Nehemiah is being accused of building the wall for personal gain so that he could be a king. Nehemiah knows why he's there. Nehemiah, we find out earlier in the chapters, had prayed extensively as the royal cupbearer, God, please use me in a way to further this ministry. Please use me in a way to help. And when the king granted him permission and he's praying to God, God, you're commissioning me to do this work. He knew that God had called him to do that. So when people are saying, you know, all you're doing is trying to set yourself up as this pseudo king, he's like, okay, you're just making stuff up. That's not what I'm here for. Nehemiah had a resolve of what he was there to accomplish. Not only that, Nehemiah led with an incredible amount of discernment. Everywhere he went, people were measuring everything he said so that they could hold it against him. When he would go imagine going around the nobles, talking to them about the work, oh, Tobias, you never know what Nehemiah said today. This is what he said. This is the progress. This is what they're doing. Da, 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 da. And they're writing letters back to each other. It, it's, it's, it, it, everywhere he went, he had to discern not only the situation, but because he knew why he was there, he had to listen intently to the motives that were going on. Here he goes to a prophet's house. The prophet's like, oh, you're not safe. Come into the temple. He's like, no, I'm not going to do that. He knew that there was a trap to meet with them. He knew that people were trying to sway him. But I think more than that, he knew what the voice of the Lord was for him. And so, for instance, in verse 11, he says, Should a man like me run away, or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life, I will not go. Knowing why you're there, what God's called you to do, Give, gave Nehemiah discernment into listening to the voices that were pressing on him. 
It gave him discernment. Another thing that I see through Nehemiah's example is that in every step of the way, he led through prayer. He actually says here in verse 9, They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work. It will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Nehemiah knew why he was there. And what the people were really trying to do, Sanballat, not only was to put pressure on Nehemiah that he would crack, or what they were trying to do was put pressure on the people that they would stop. They were fed up. So Nehemiah, being onslaughted by this people criticizing, constantly, they don't want to see these people thrive. He's like, God, in these 52 days that I've been laboring in a really tough job, in the physical work that has to get done, in the mental anguish from other people, strengthen us for this. Also, in verse 14, he says, Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God, because what they have done. You see, part of Nehemiah's resolve was that he constantly went before the Lord and says, God, I see what they're doing. It doesn't look like maybe other people see it, but I do know who does see it. It's you. You see what they're doing to me right now. You see what they're trying to cause me to do. So God, all I want you to do is remember that. I want you to act justly. One of the greatest hopes for Christians throughout the centuries, especially people that were poor, that were the minority, that felt that the majority was oppressing them, the poor that had no one to rescue them, especially in places where, you know, I mean, I hope you realize that uh, social services like we enjoy in the United States did not exist for millenniums. It was, you're on your own, your family took care of you, or you're out in the street trying to figure it out. There was no social net to catch you. All this pressure is coming down on Nehemiah. And he goes, God, I want you to remember what they're doing. Do not forget. They knew, and people know, throughout the centuries, God, this oppression that I'm feeling right now from other people, you see exactly what's happening, and what I believe about you is you will deal with it. It won't go undone. You, will see, you see it all. And then, what I love it here, he mentions this prophet by name, and how the rest of these prophets who have been hired, who have sold out, and their only purpose is to intimidate him. To dissuade him from continuing on. Another thing that Nehemiah does is he leads from humility. I, I think as I think about Nehemiah and how he <clears throat> handled the pressure from people discouraging him, you're not cut out for this, you're never going to finish, publicly going to embarrass you. He could have got really angry because he had permission to be there from the king. And he could have went out on a campaign proving himself right. But what's interesting is that Nehemiah leads from a humble confidence. I think when he responds back to the prophet, and when he asks him the question, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? Nehemiah is asking, who do you think I am? I'm not going to run away from my enemy. I know why I'm here. That confidence that Nehemiah gave him, gave him a humility to not exalt himself above the situation. How dare they do this to me? Don't they know who I am? I'm just done with all of you people. It didn't make him the martyr in the story, but it gave him an ability to do something. Through his humility, he was able to lead. In his humility, 
he was able to not only have discernment for what's going on, but he was able to strengthen the people that were around him. In his humility, he constantly asked God for guidance. God, this project is way bigger than I could have ever imagined. <clears throat> this project is way harder than I could ever thought of. I, I, I need you to help me. There's no way I can finish this. In every way, I think in Nehemiah's story here in chapter 6, with all this pressure, he constantly looks to God to help guide him in key moments of discouragement. Psalm 25, 9, he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. And there's a way in what God has done to allow us to walk in humility in, in the midst of discouraging events. You know, in Nehemiah's resolve here, in being able to discern amongst all the noise, from whether from the nobles, whether from the enemies, whether from the work itself, he realized not only had God called him there, but the level of humility he was able to take into it, I believe gave him a level of sanity. And that sanity came from he knew what he was there for. He knew what God called him to do. And he knew that God was with him in the midst of the discouragement, in the midst of the work. That the physical labor, the mental work of trying to figure out how to do the job, and also the discouragement from everybody around him. God gave him a resolve to walk through it. Gave him the humility to walk through it. I think the attribute of humility and leadership is one of the greatest things that we can model to other people. Humility, I think though, comes from the fact that you can see yourself in this part of the story. And what I mean by that is, you are not the story that God is using you as part of the story. I'm one part of many parts that God's working. I am not the story. I am not the person. I think what pride tends to do, it tends to conflate people to view themselves above other people. I have a more important job than you do. My work's more sacred than yours. And I think what happens is it causes us to push off other people. You, can't, you don't know how hard my job is. If I told you how hard my job is, you wouldn't be giving me this type of pressure. Humility doesn't do that. Humility says, God, I know you're with me in the midst of all this pressure. And you can act in discernment because you can hear things that in pride you can't hear. Hey, we want to have a meeting with you because uh, we want to tell you how this works. Listen, man, I'm, God's called me to a job right now. I, I cannot be a part of that conversation. The nobles coming to him. Hey, you know, I really think you should do this, this, and that. Hey, I'm not going to be swayed from what I'm doing. I know why I'm here. And I don't, the text never tries to conflate Nehemiah as this person who was trying to subvert, this person that's trying to take over. What it does is they kept trying to associate that with him. All you're trying to do is subvert and take over and, and gain power. This whole wall thing is a power play so that you could be on top. He's like, no, that's not why I'm here. The last thing I think is how do you maintain a heart of humility? Is that you understand what the gospel is all about. You see, the story of Christianity is Instead of acting in humility towards one another, in love towards one another, we don't do that at all. We act in our self-interest, we act in pride, we don't listen deeply to the other people around us, we don't really love other people well. And the story of Christianity is, there was somebody who did listen to people well. There was somebody who was more humble. He had a place of power and prestige that none of us had. But he didn't use that power and prestige to, to use it as influence over others. 
he'd allow people to do things to him which in his power he could have thwarted, but he didn't do it. You see, when Jesus was, when he came, said, and talked about his humility with people, he listened to them, he taught them, he spent time with them. He could have said, you know what, I don't got time for any of this. I'm come here to do my, the Father's will, so get out of the way, I'm headed to the cross, people. He took them on a journey of three years, doing miracles, showing them. When they didn't understand what he said, he goes, you guys are a little slow of hearing, let me tell you again. When Satan said, hey, Jesus, I know you're like super powerful and you could jump off this mountain and these angels would come up and pick you right up. He goes, yeah, I, I, yeah, I get all that, Satan. But that, what, is, what, is my, what did my father tell me to do? What am I here for? You see, there was a humility about Jesus that marked his life. He had all the power in the world, but it said he emptied himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. And I think for us, the way that we maintain humility in the midst of voices is we know our position. You see, it says that <clears throat> he who knew no sin, Jesus, who knew no sin, he became sin for us so that we might become his righteousness. So the reason that I'm able to stand amongst the discouragement from outsiders, from the hard work that I have to do, is realize that the story is not about me. The reason that, that we are here to work, to use our gifts to serve other people, is not about us. It's about him. Because he's done it. He's given us a model of how we should love other people. And what happens is, we, I think we too easily get baited into, well, you know, that wasn't right. And you know what? I probably would agree with you on 100% of your claims of how other people weren't right to you. And you're probably right. But humility, loving other people well, it's a lot of work. <laughs> It's not easy. But you don't lead other people through pride. You have to, only way to lead people well is through humility. It's humbling yourself, knowing your position under God, knowing that he's called you, knowing the work out ahead of you to do. When we make mistakes, we confess to each other, hey, I'm sorry. And then from that, we move from the places of humility and we take steps. When Nehemiah was mistreated by these people, he went to God. He said, God, you know this isn't fair and right. And I know you know that. And I know you remember that. So please do what's right. He was able to come to him to communicate his frustrations and his pain. So life is incredibly complicated, it's messy. There's problems, there's discouragements. That's the reality. But the way that we live through it is demonstrated in an attitude and a heart of humility. How can I do that? I know that in myself, I don't have any ability. But in what Jesus has done for me, his example where he left all things for me, that I can do that for others. Because he's forgiven me of my pride, of my insecurity, my hatred towards others, my, the things in my heart that are wrong. And what I have to do is I have to come before him, say, God, strengthen me, strengthen me for your work, and strengthen me to do what you've called me to do. Help me to be humble. Help me to treat people with respect as you would want me to. Help me to see other people flourish. Help me to listen. You know what? I'm not going to get it right tomorrow or the next day. But I know by grace that you're going to give me the strength to do it. I can keep coming to you. And I think it's a beautiful lesson where we can make a difference towards others through humility. Through loving them. Treating them as Jesus treated us. It's difficult. It takes a lot of work, a lot of repentance, a lot of confessing. But realize this, God is with you and with me through this journey together.
to the complicated messiness of our stories. And our story doesn't revolve around us. It revolves around him. And we get to be a part of that story. And that's a humbling thing for us. But it also gives us the strength to come at each and every day, looking at the work ahead of us, saying, God, be with us. Lord, we know that you're for us. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this encouragement. In the book of Nehemiah, that when people are discouraging, when situations are discouraging, um, God, and we hear voices of, um, to try to throw us off from what you've called us to do. Lord, help us not to retaliate. Help us to be um, humble. Help us to listen. Help us to repent often. Uh, Lord, help us to love one another like you've commanded us to do. So we thank you, Lord, for what you've done and what you continue to do. We pray that you would give us strength as a church to do these things. In your name we pray. Amen.